Charles Cecil, besides Ron Gilbert, Tim Schafer and Al Lowe, is perhaps one of the most influential heads in the point-and-click adventure genre. The polite English gentleman has been developing these games for 25 years now, together with his company Revolution Software. His early masterpieces include Lure of the Temptress and the cyberpunk thriller Beneath the Steel Sky. But it was with Broken Sword, a series of mystery detective adventures starting 1994, that his fame became legendary. In Broken Sword 1, the American tourist George Stobart and the journalist Nicole Collard uncover a conspiracy of the Knights Templar in Paris. Their hunt for a murderer leads them through all of Europe until, in the end, they stumble into a dark Templar ritual in Scotland. Cecil himself was completely taken up in the research work for this game, fascinated by historical facts and made-up myths. I got very, very excited by the background of the Templars. And, and really it was crazy because we had a, a history that worked really, really well. And from that history I derived the main puzzles, but I hadn't written the story. All I knew was what happened in the middle. So we went a long way into production with um, a manuscript which I designed, but without actually knowing what happened at the beginning of the, and the end. Which is crazy, because ultimately the middle, of course, has to support the themes that are created in the introduction and then play out and have their climax at the end. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit naive to, um, to totally base a story on, or sort of to base a game on, because ultimately all that matters is the gameplay. All of these things have to ultimately support gameplay. The puzzle quality and the general focus on puzzles in Broken Sword varied. In most cases, gameplay progress depended on dialogue rather than real puzzles. Sometimes there were simple item combination puzzles and in one infamous case, even timing mattered. But story and atmosphere seemed to be more important to Cecil then. He was still searching for his way, gameplay-wise. From the at times rather inconsistent puzzles in Broken Sword 1 to a box sliding puzzle in Part 3 and real brain twisters in recent years. In Broken Sword 5, Cecil really managed to deliver puzzles that were at the same time realistic and entertaining and that made the player feel as clever as a real-life archaeologist. A solid historical background is still one of the pillars that make Broken Sword so believable. Following the Templars in Part 1, Cecil now goes for the Cathars and other Christian sects in Part 5. Of course, you shouldn't take every word at face value that is said in the games about these groups and their beliefs, but most of it is grounded in reality. And what, what I've tried to do in, in our games is to try and cut through the nonsense, like the prior sign, and actually look for these truths that are bubbling up. And I'm, what, what really fascinates me is the truths, the, 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 the plight of the Gnostics, what the Gnostics believe, the dualism, the idea of Lucifer um, being the bringer of knowledge, and all of these things which clearly have some sort of basis of fact, and to try and bring a more honest account than the Da Vinci Code or, or a lot of those other um, nonsense books. Speaking of The Da Vinci Code, the hit novel came out several years after Broken Sword 1 and to be honest it does at no point reach the narrative or research detail quality of the game. A lot of fans are absolutely convinced that The Da Vinci Code, that, sorry, that Dan Brown when he wrote The Da Vinci Code must have played Broken Sword because it's an American comes to Paris, meets a French girl and they both get caught up in a conspiracy, a modern day conspiracy involving the Knights Templar and they attempt to kill them at the beginning. So there are so many similarities. But good luck. I mean, Dan Brown in many ways brought that whole sort of biblical, historical um, history and, 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 and conspiracy involving it to the forefront. And, you know, I admire him for that and congratulate him for him. And many people say that Brown may have never visited the places he's writing about either and gets a lot of the facts just wrong. Whereas Cecil travelled through Europe to do his research to visit the monastery of Mont saint among other places. Autodidactically, he became an expert on Christian cults and conspiracy theories. His reputation even opened some doors in Hollywood. I mean, the irony, of course, is that I was actually invited to work um, on the, 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 the video game of the film, of the book, a few years ago. And that sounds complicated, it the connection. Is complicated. It is complicated. And I was actually phoned up by, by Take-Two, who um, I'd worked with, and, and really, you know, they're, they're a great publisher. And they asked me if I'd like to be involved, and I said, oh, well, maybe. And then a week later, um, I got a phone call, um, and the person from Take-Two said, you've got to come over and meet Ron Howard, because, you know, he really doesn't like what's going on with this, with this game, and, um, and, and you need to help me out. I said, but I haven't even agreed to work on the project. You need to come anyway, and, and, and they won't ask. It's just important that you, you're, you're there. Okay, so, so I flew over to, to Los Angeles and went to this wonderful, wonderful Imagine Productions, 
I was met by the senior vice uh, president of Sony Pictures, who said, you know, we're so pleased you're here. She's really bright and, and lovely lady. She said, um, we're so pleased, you know, you don't need to get involved at all, but just the fact that you're here is important. Okay, thank you. So in, in walks Ron Howard, and uh, the first thing he says is, I don't think there should be a game at all. And this woman says, Ron, there's a contract. These guys have played a lot of money, and it's helped the film. There's going to be a game. Okay, says Ron. In that case, uh, there can be no marketing. Ron, there's going to be marketing. That's what the contract says. There has to be marketing. Otherwise, they can't sell their game. Okay, says Ron. He consults with his lawyer. It has to come six months after the film. Ron, it's not going to be six months after the film. It's going to be day and date. That's what the contract says. So Ron looks into her eyes and says, so what are you going to do with my story? And she looks straight back and says, Ron, we're so pleased you answered that question because we've flown this guy all the way from England and he's going to tell you what we're going to do with your story. So anyone, everyone's looking around the room, including me, and I suddenly realised that actually I'm going to have to tell him what we're going to do with the story. And I haven't actually thought it through yet because I haven't been commissioned to work on this project yet. So he looks at me and he says, so, so what do you know about all this stuff? And I, 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 luckily I'd been to a Knights Templar ceremony in Worcester Cathedral um, a few months earlier, so I told him all about that and he seemed impressed. He said, and, and where do you come from? I said, oh, I come from the city of York in England, which of course is where uh, Constantine the Great was declared emperor, which I bet nobody knows, but Constantine the Great, the great Constantine who formed Constantinople, was actually declared emperor in York in England because his father, who was the emperor, was garrisoned there and, and died. So we actually got on really, really well and, and, and had a really fun time. And he said, tell me, about the, tell me about what you're going to do. And I said, symbolism. It's all about symbolism. Um, we're going to, in the way that in a medieval painting, uh, Mary Magdalene is always depicted in red and the Virgin Mary in blue, we're going to take that symbolism and we're going to take it into the game. And he went, wow, that's really good. And he, talked to, he turned around to Akiva Goldsman, who's his writer, and said, do you know, I love it. I love it. Sophie Neveu wearing a shawl when she comes out of Roslyn Chapel. And he looked at me and says, is it red or blue? I went, red, red, red for Mary Magdalene. And we had a really good time, actually. I really liked him. And, and all, of, all of my ideas went into the film. And all I can say is I did look for my name on the credits, but, but it must have been, they must have been going too fast because, you know, I just didn't see them there. In the past, Cecil went overboard with some of his stories. During the 2000s make Alumania, even George Stobart had to save the world and had to fight a dragon at the end of Broken Sword 3. Perhaps a bit much for a story that started out as a low-key detective thriller with a hint of mystery. At Broken Sword 1 we have a kind of supernaturally thing, but, but ultimately the background and the story have to answer a simple question. Okay? And that question is, what are the antagonists after, what are they trying to achieve, and why must the protagonist stop them. Okay? So what is this what is this thing that is so powerful that if they were to get it, there would be disaster? Now the problem is that you know these guys could easily go and get a nuclear bomb. They could easily get the weapons that we know about. So what they're after has to be something of more power than you could normally get. And that's kind of why it goes into I, I want don't want to be too supernatural. But it's, it's kind of meant to feel ethereal, it's meant to feel believable. It is slightly supernatural. But think of the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they open the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and all that wind swirls around. That's kind of the level of supernatural that we're going for, no more than that. But, but it is specifically because whatever the antagonists are after, they have to really, really want it because of the power. And for the reason, that's the same reason. The, the protagonists really, really must stop them getting it. Later on, Cecil wound a bit down. Part 4 and 5 turned out more down to earth. It even seems as if the newest part is rather a sequel to Broken Sword 2, not only concerning the old fashioned gameplay that gets along without action sequences or sliding puzzles. When we, when we were at the first Broken Sword game, we had no idea whether there were going to be any more at all. And Virgin, in particular, who are our publisher, who were great to work with, um, were not keen at all on, to commission a second. And eventually they did on the basis that we needed to write it within a year, which we did. And at that point we said that it would be a trilogy. And that trilogy was kind of hoping that maybe there would be a third game. 
So when we then had that published by THQ or commissioned by THQ, it was really reaching the climax. And so kind of we thought we were lucky to be able to write three. And the big mistake was to come up with such a climactic ending. So then we wrote a fourth. And the fourth was very del deliberately starting on, on a low because we felt that was the only way to explain away Broken Sword 3 and the idea that they would have seen a dragon. And you're absolutely right, when, when, when I designed Broken Sword 5, it was kind of after the end of Broken Sword 2, on the basis that then we didn't need to worry too much about the climactic ending of Broken Sword 3 and the, the beginning of Broken Sword 4. So, I mean, you are right in many ways, but, but these games like Tintin, I, I think they're like Tintin books, you, you can read them in any order, that was always the objective. But, but, but for somebody who's played all five, I would agree with you that, that it does seem maybe a little bit strange, and I apologise to people for that. Cecil has learned a lot from his early gameplay mistakes. Today he tries different approaches. Well, the way that I approach Broken Sword 5, and indeed you know, all our adventure games now, is to have multiple things going on in parallel. So first of all, we start with a two-page story document. And that's it. We have to tell the, the story as a precy in two pages to make sure that there's an emotional beat, that there's emotional beats. And then that story stays where it is. And then from there, we obviously design what interface is and anything new that we want to do. And then in parallel, I start designing the great gameplay moments, the, the, the gameplay moments that people will remember. So if you remember with Broken Sword 5, the great gameplay moment was Nico hanging from the um, for, hanging from the, the cable car, and a lot of the previous elements then fed back into that. Um, so actually, we found ourselves designing gameplay to fit the cover art, which is slightly crazy. But it was great. It was great because it was dramatic and it, it 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 allowed us to. So all of these things are kind of in parallel, and it's only when all of them feel like they work that we start moulding them together. And the two-page document stays as a story pitch, but it goes to three and four and five and eventually turns into a 20-page story. And that always stays in, as an independent doc because uh, only then can you make sure that actually the emotional beats are what, what you want. And that then cross-pollinates into the design document, which obviously has to support the story, but then the, um, but then the design doc also is these great moments, and then we flesh that out. So, so those always stay in parallel. And part of that is a knee-jerk reaction to the idiot, the, the, the stupidness of actually, as I did with the first Broken Sword, pretty much designing the middle of a game around the background themes without thinking about what the emotional beats that ran through the story were. Gameplay comes first, in spite of all the importance of narrative elements. That's why filmmakers are not automatically good game designers. An obvious thing to say, but ultimately all that really matters is the gameplay. And clearly a really strong story and a really strong background should allow you to write better gameplay. And uh, but 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 you know we, we work in an interactive medium and it's not about the story. And I mean I would argue, and, and I'm sure many would disagree, that our, as storytellers, our job is a lot harder than a linear linear story. If you write it, if you read a script, it'll take you about an hour, and you should know at the end of that how good the story is and whether the characters. We don't have the equivalent. We don't have the equivalent in games. Nothing even close. So the only thing is. If I'm the director of these, then it's in my head. And that's why I need all of these things. But the story on one hand might work, the design on the other. But the director needs to know that actually everything is going to come and be able to see the final vision. Because there is currently, it's too complex. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a level of complexity above, it's a dimension above linear story writing. And that's not to say that linear story writers aren't absolutely brilliant because they need to get the characterization, they need to get the emotion. But then we need to take as much of that, we need to get that as right as possible, and then we need to put the interactive element in, which is undoubtedly another dimension. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to write for games. But look at Steven Spielberg. He, he came in to work with EA, and he was going to write an Opus Magnum. And in the end, he came up with Boom Blocks, and, and his Opus Magnum was cancelled. So, so you know, Peter Jackson came in, and he was going to write Halo with Microsoft, and that got cancelled too. And I think what's particularly interesting is to look at actually both the opportunities and the constraints of interactivity. And it should be no surprise to anybody that these, these brilliant, brilliant film writers and filmmakers just don't get interactive because there is this additional dimension that they can't possibly understand. Charles Cecil is taken up in his job, but from time to time he finds the time to play some games himself, even a German one. I really enjoy playing adventure games from, from other developers, and particularly independent developers, because they're very fresh and they've got new ideas, which I can you know, take inspiration from. 
Um, I, I really like the Didalic games. Um, they're being so successful at the moment, and they've got really nice ideas. The idea, of, the idea of, of 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 a lunatic woman in an asylum and, and a cloth rabbit that talks to you. You know, I, I just love the idea of them going to a publisher and suggesting that they commission it, which would never have happened in a million years. But then there's some really interesting things coming from the App Store as well. So I love the beauty of Monument Valley, um, the Room, the Room Two. Um, it's a very, very innovative time at the moment because, because developers can publish themselves and there, there aren't the gatekeepers of, of retail and there aren't the gatekeepers of publishers. Not to be rude about either of them, you know, they, they were very valuable, they were vital at that time. But digital distribution has allowed this extraordinary independent scene which is, 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 I think, great for developers and it's great for our audience as well, for gamers, because they have a much wider choice and they can choose, rather than being told by the publisher who publishes, sorry, that commissions, or the retailer that chooses what it stocks. They can choose what games, not only they play, but further down the line that they then support in terms of crowdfunding. So I think it's a very exciting time all round. The last details for Broken Sword are finished just now. Charles Cecil doesn't know what will be next. Perhaps he should just relax and enjoy the applause for a moment. I, I don't take any of this for granted. I'm always incredibly flattered that actually people want to wait. Sometimes, for in this particular case, we finished 15 minutes late and people waited 15, 20 minutes. I'm hugely flattered that people want to do that. It's, it's a huge privilege to be able to communicate with people and to create a, an entertainment product that people are so passionate about. And so I do feel very proud of that.